And my name is Javier Fernandez Salvador, and I'm, uh, today I'm also with uh, Erica Cherno. She's a faculty research assistant for a strawberry project at the Northland Research Extension from OSU uh, at, uh, in Aurora. And uh, Tessa Barker, she also has this a now grad student that is, uh, has contributed to this project. She will be presenting her poster uh, a, a little bit later today, so please don't miss that session, and I'll talk about that uh, too. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a brief story of what's going on with strawberries in Oregon. Um, Oregon was at some point the number one state producer of uh, a state that produces strawberries in the United States. And that has of course shifted over time and now California is number one, Florida is number two, and Oregon is used sometimes in number three or number four depending on the year. And um, it has mostly focused on the process market. So um, strawberries that have been bred to retain the calyx when harvested, uh, to separate the calyx and retain the calyx in the plant uh, so that they are quickly sent to either being pureed or frozen. And so uh, all of the cultivars that we use for fresh market production actually come from uh, uh, California. And in recent years, there's been a decrease in growers that have been uh, producing uh, for the process market, and that's mainly the reason of, uh, of uh, price. Uh, of course, if you grow for market, your costs are pretty similar to what you would have in fresh production, but your, what you get paid is a lot less. And um, this has uh, shown also, this is what ha what's happened with that, with that shift, is that there has been an increase in fresh market growers, and also um, a, an increase in organic growers producing strawberries, okay? We are currently conducting a, a needs assessment evaluation for to try to determine, we don't really know much about the organic side of strawberry production with heavy figures for Oregon, but we do a little bit about the conventional side. Now, um, Oregon Tilt has done a review of the market for this in a report that they published, and uh, Oregon does not meet the local demand with the fruit that produced here. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, the majority of the fruit that we consume in the state actually still comes from California. And uh, there is an advantage of all of these because we have uh, higher premiums for uh, fresh, a lot of uh, focus on local products here in Oregon, and uh, off-season is a great uh, opportunity for growers. So um, first, the first, the first part that we looked at was producing uh, containerized transplants for organic strawberries. Instead of just doing direct uh, bare root planting in the field, we looked at potting these plants in the greenhouse so that we, even if it's not a heated greenhouse, uh, these day neutral cultivars start, as soon as you have a little bit of uh, 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 decent temperature for them to start developing, uh, if you keep them in a, in a tunnel, uh, you can get uh, plants uh, much earlier than what you would get with production and growth, much earlier than you would get with plants that are directly uh, planted in the, in the soil. So um, we, uh, the idea is to start potting up all of these bare roots in trays uh, in January and even February, have them grown for, uh, for about a month to a month and a half, and then transplant them into low tunnels. So you could really start looking at production as early as end of March or early April, which is absolutely not common right now in Oregon with a few exceptions, and mostly for organic growers, actually. So um, yeah, this is the poster that will be uh, in the other session, so please stop by. Tessa will tell you a little bit about this uh, part of the project. But um, we, it's important to also no to note here that, uh, yeah, the, how this transplant can be available in a three to, I would say, three to six week period, depending on when you plant them. Now, um, we are looking at having also, um, including some harvest manipulation things. So that we can uh, have this uh, app locate our harvest in times where the price is higher. That is very important for us. So it's not just combining how to produce early and late, but also how to manage this plant so that in the middle of the summer, when everyone has organic strawberries, we uh, trim, trim, trim and prune the plants back so that um, they um, can start producing later. So um, this is what you would see generally in Oregon uh, for the processing market for June bearing cultivars, right? The harvest is usually from June to July, depending on which cultivar. 
and then the planting happens in April or in the previous fall. They don't produce that first year. You have to wait a full year with processing cultivars for you to get a harvest. And then they go through something that's called renovation, where they are mowed. They're not grown on plastic, these processing cultivars. And they, the following year, and mowed, mowed fertilized water in the late part of summer, and then they produce the following year. But that window of production is very small. Now, when you have, we're talking about fresh market varieties, these day neutral varieties, they actually can uh, produce for a little longer. They are if they're planted that same year, they can produce a small crop that first year, and they you can keep them up to two or three years in Oregon. And they the window is a lot at a little bit longer, right? Uh, when you're talking about start production, maybe in June, sometimes even in uh, May, and then all the way into September. What we are proposing is to have our plug production in January and February, planting into high tunnels, into low tunnels, and uh, future regions actually will be thinking about looking at high tunnels too, but um, planting in March, and we have our first harvest in April, all the way to June when the market starts to pick up and the prices start to go low. Then we do uh, manipulation and renovation, bring, cut them all back, and they come for a second harvest in September. This past year, we did all of the full part uh, of the project, and we were harvesting in low tunnels all the way into Thanksgiving. So uh, with the changes that we get with also climate change, that can benefit this kind of manipulation for us. So here is a chart of what you would see um, in general with the precipitation. This is the biggest issue for us to produce fresh strawberries, and like California, where they don't have that rain early in some parts of the year, and in the late parts of the year. In Oregon, we have a lot of rain in the spring, a lot of rain in the fall, historically. So, if you see, uh, that is the harvest time, the harvest window for all the different cultivars. So we have good to uh, uh, totem, philomoth, uh, putrid crimson, putrid reliance, charm, all of those June-bearing cultivars. Mostly for processing markets, some of those are dual purpose, actually, but they produce in that small window. Then when we look at the California varieties, Albion and Seascape, you have much of a larger window, but it's also related to the time where we don't have rain. Now, with low tunnels, combining the low tunnels with those manipulation techniques and the right cultivars, we could really start harvesting as early as um, May to late March and all the way into November. So what are low tunnels? And the low tunnels are these structures. In this case, uh, we're, we're looking at maybe two and a half to three feet tall structures that are uh, uh, single hoops that cover a, sing a single row. Uh, in a, it could be on a raised bed or flat ground. And our preliminary study goal was to look at eight different types of tunnels, mainly to make and to see how we can make this technique affordable to growers. Now, this is used widely in countries like Argentina, where they, instead of having the rain problem, they can have hail during the uh, summer months even. So, and that, of course, ruins your harvest. So these are widely used in very large acreage. So we were thinking, okay, we have to present this alternative to growers, and the way to do it is probably with playing with these low tunnels. So the benefits of low tunnels are, uh, of course, season extension, right? and then protects the fruit from the elements. We keep them under the tunnel, so of course you don't worry about the rain. And then it lowers disease incidence, and that is something that we will be looking at in the future too. And then increases total yield and fruit size because of the season extension, and also the ability to reduce the disease incidence. And in addition to that, um, there have been studies that have shown that it reduces runner emergence which is something that you want in those day neutral cultivars. Unlike the June berry cultivars, where you want more runners because they're not grown in plastic, the uh, uh, day neutral cultivars, you want to reduce that runnering so that your plants can focus on producing more trusses for fruit. And then uh, we also have um, many season, uh, cold season vegetables that could also be rotated in these low tunnels, in organic systems. Okay. So in this, this is what we looked at last year. We didn't do the earlier part because we didn't uh, come, with the, come up with the funding for the start. That's where, what we're doing this year. 
but we looked at the later part of the fall. And what you can see here, that a couple of interesting things happened in, uh, here, and I'm uh, not going to go into the test and management side uh, in this presentation. But we uh, first started with the planting, and we had a really nice marketable yield, and uh, not a lot of coal, or, or not a lot of, of non-marketable fruit. But then we had issues with ligus bug, uh, that is one of the main problems that you have in strawberries. So not necessarily that the yield went back, but the quality didn't make it marketable for fresh market. So that's the increase that you see there. And then we did a mid-season renovation where we went and cut everything down when the market price is high, is the lowest. Waited a little bit, and then we had that high yield spike at the end when we, and then we started, that also gave us the opportunity to get used to how are we going to manage the light as well and, and not have a problem later in the season. Um, now I'm going to leave this part uh, for Erica. Uh, she's going to tell you about the types of tunnels that we did real quick. And we were able to find different options on cost for them. Yeah, so as Javier mentioned, cost is an important component. We work with primarily small farmers here in Oregon. Um, there are a lot of companies that sell kits online. Um, we, we look at those, and some of them are as high as $450 for a 100 foot of tunnel. So um, some of them are lower than that, but maybe all you're getting is the plastic and the wire. There's nothing to stake them down, tie them down, or any of the other materials you need. So we obviously felt like we could do that a bit cheaper, so we, we had these eight different tunnels. We use three different types of uh, plastic. Two of them are perforated. One has these slits in them. Um, so just kind of along the side of the plastic, there's the, kind of these slits, and the others have these punched holes, kind of like a little hole puncher went all, all the way through the plastic. And what happens is when the temperature heats up, the, the plastic contracts, and that kind of opens up those slits and those holes in the plastic and allows them to self-ventilate. So if you remember that first picture that Javier showed, one of those tunnels had a lot of condensation in it. That was the other type of plastic we used, which was a thicker greenhouse plastic. So those you do have to raise and lower uh, quite frequently, depending on the temperature, humidity, et cetera, of the day. Um, so it does take a little uh, labor involved in terms of making sure the tunnels are raised and lower. Um, other things we looked at were different types of tie-down material, twine and bungee. Um, we used different types of wire, kind of a, a thin, wire that you can bend as well, and this is actually um, conduit, electrical conduit, and we just got a conduit bender and uh, just uh, simply shaped them into the shapes that we need. Obviously the conduit is a bit thicker and sturdier versus the wire, which is quite thin on a windy day, it can kind of rattle around. So we use different combinations of the conduit and the wire. Um, the conduit was a bit expensive, um, or more expensive than the wire, so on some of these where you see higher prices, like uh, these two right here. This one was using all conduit with twine as a um, tie-down material. This one um, used a mix of uh, wire and conduit, but what, what really drove up the price there was the bungee. So um, the perforated plastics are quite affordable. Using the, the pin wire is very affordable as well as twine. Yeah, and uh, just one thing more about these. Uh, with the conduit, standard size is 10 foot long, and we don't use a 10 feet. Uh, so we use about five and a half, depending on the way we're trying different heights. But we had the leftover, and uh, our te bioscience technician that works in the project started actually, if you see a figure B, there's a joint there where we use a piece of rubber because we wanted to maximize the amount of material that we could use. And the, all of the structures lasted until November when we started to have those winds. You do have to take your plastic down in November. You don't leave it out there all, all, all winter long. And, uh, we, and we, it was sturdy enough where it didn't present any problems. No, so now, the future research. We are going to be looking, now we chose our best treatments of the different plastic and tunnel types. And uh, we will be looking at temperature and humidity in between, inside the tunnels, outside, in the soil, air, air temperatures so that we can actually back all of our research with that data on uh, the specific conditions inside the tunnel. And we will be looking at also yield, fruit quality, disease incidence, uh, biomass, uh, growth, and development of the plant in the future. Um, and just to finish up, I would like to acknowledge all of the different people that have been, you can look at this later in more detail, but uh, when we, it's uh, updated to, um, uh, organic, 
But um, we received this support from the legislature because there hasn't been a person that has been doing re uh, extension work for strawberries in a while. And uh, that's how, uh, interestingly enough, that was supported by the commission. And the commission doesn't receive funds from uh, the uh, uh, organic growers. So we are also trying to bring a little bit of organic production into the conventional sites so that they can see the benefits of that such system. And I'll also leave that information open for the strawberry survey. And thank you so much for your time. Uh, for pollination, we, the, at the station we have various projects that have the breeding projects, the uh, blackberries and raspberries, and they actually bring uh, bees for all of the different projects. Now, the tunnels are managed. They're required to be raised and lowered so that the bees actually can go in and out. And we did see some times where the bees were being, would, would stay there uh, inside the tunnel, but they erase it and they come out. And bees really like strawberries. Do you have any tentative data on the economic? I mean, you're obviously doing this for an economic reason and a marketing reason. It was very clear at the beginning. Have you collected any data on the economics benefits of this yet? On the cost and prices? Yeah, and, and yeah, how how much production, therefore, how much you know, how much more gross income you get doing the system? And that will be part of the next trial. Yeah, and, and uh, we uh, this project is also coordinated with the organic growers club in Corvallis because uh, the students can act, we don't sell them. I, we just as part of the reason we don't sell the fruit, but we give it to them so that we can actually get some market price data. That's really interesting. The problem there is that they are used to uh, summer season. We came with our fruit in October and November. There weren't any students to sell them. So we, we have to really start figuring and playing with those little details to make it work. I, I think your data showed that for the October-November harvest, there was a significant drop off in the marketable product, quite a bit of loss. What factors came up really big in that? For the loss? Yeah. And they are marketable. marketable. Yes. So, so why we had less marketable fruit? Yeah, that, uh, that's a direct, uh, at this point I'm really looking at the total fruit because the reason why we didn't have that is because we weren't picking. The students go back to class and we rely on student labor. So we basically were doing a, a fast pick, not separating the fruit later, but not really having the, the, the labor there to do all of the things that we wanted and get market fruit. Yeah, and I'll also note that we didn't get these tunnels in um, until probably about this summer, late summer, and we already had the tritus in the field at that point um, in, in, in practice. And once you have those, the spores are present and they continue to spread. So we're hoping by getting the tunnels in early this year, the plants will be protected throughout the season. It will reduce disease incidents throughout the season and later into the fall as well. Thank you. One more question. Uh, yeah, we've been. Colleagues have been looking at uh, plexiglass strawberry in our way a lot over many years. Uh, are you considering a system that covers more than one row at a time? It's the so called minimum approach rather than the approach? Well, uh, not necessarily. I mean, I'm, they, there's a lot of research on low tunnels on the East Coast. Uh, they have been doing, and, and the Midwest, I would say, the Midwest and the East Coast, they've been doing this for, for a very long time. Now, we were looking at our conditions are very different, and that gives us an actually prime advantage for the control crops. Um, but going back to your question, larger tunnels, we don't know yet. We are talking about row cover height, knee height that cover multiple rows. Knee height that cover multiple rows, no. Yes. No, that would, that would actually, we, just to bring this small change to the industry here, We've been seeing a lot of resistance, especially from large growers, because of cost, of course. Small growers are very receptive to it, because it brings that uh, ability to bring fruit to market earlier, right? But uh, I, I'm, we would have to, it's, it's a matter of what uh, support we get from the industry, and I'm not sure we're, we're there yet. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you, Maria.